Would you like me to activate the machine guns? At a time when FPS fans just keep getting win after win, with games like 40k Bolt Gun, Trepang 2, System Shock, and now the Quake 2 Remaster, we've got yet another title to add to that list with the full release for Turbo Overkill. Developed by Trigger Happy Interactive and published by Apogee Entertainment, it's a fast, violent, and visceral movement shooter set in the futuristic city of Paradise, where a rogue program named Sin has taken over and is dead set on destroying all life. So it's up to you, Johnny Turbo, to put a stop to the whole thing with your trusty AI companion Sam, who's the most likable artificial character since BT in Titanfall 2. Good hunting, sir. He's even voiced by Duke Nukem himself, John St. John. Fasten your seatbelt. Maybe fasten it more than that. <laughs> I love that little guy. Now, I took a look at the first episode for this a while back, which was only comprised of seven or so levels, but even back then and in its current state, it was plain to see that that thing had a whole lot of potential. In fact, I haven't even actually played Turbo Overkill since that original video either, and in that time, not only have they completely finished that first episode, but also the other two episodes as well which means it's gone from being a very polished demo and a vertical slice into a fully completed product and truthfully one of the best shooters to not only come out in 2023, but just in general. take my money. So if all you wanted to know from watching this video was whether or not you had to buy this thing, well then let me just save your time up front and say yes. Yes you should. And as always, if you want to buy this game, make sure to use my GOG affiliate link which I'll put in that video description. Despite all the boomer shooters we've had over the years, and also that importance that the chainsaw plays in the DNA for this genre itself, I think it's the first time that someone's ever thought to put one of those things on someone's leg. And that really is the most defining feature of our leading man, and that's that from the knee down, he's sporting a pretty radical hacksaw and isn't afraid to use it. This thing works perfectly in tandem with the high mobility and the fast movement speed, allowing you to slide around but also use it to shred through enemies. And certain upgrades even make it so the chainsaw is going to restore both health and armor. It just makes it have much more of a purpose than just having a dash or a slide move because that's the in thing to do. I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Anyway, getting back into playing Turbo Overkill after such an extended break, it's kinda like when you go back to playing a competitive shooter online and end up getting bodied by all the other players because you're so out of practice. But a testament to how good the whole thing is, is that it barely took me 15 minutes before muscle memory started to kick back in, and I was easily getting back into that rhythm. Turbo Overkill is the kind of game where every single weapon and ability has a purpose. Even from the starting pistols up to the rocket launchers and those overpowered energy weapons, there just never becomes a time when something feels redundant. And if you're not using one of those features, it's more likely that you've just forgotten that you had it. And in true old school shooter fashion, the whole thing's broken down into three episodes with around eight levels each, ending always in a climactic boss fight. Episode 1 is a really good introduction to how the whole thing works, from all of the weapons and the mechanics through to the story and the plot. Premises that Johnny's been hired by an executive for the Terratech Corporation, heading to paradise to try to contain the Sin virus before it gets too out of hand. We have arrived, sir. Best make this a quick trip. Paradise isn't the place you want to be for long. The city is under martial law and the citizens are off the streets and hiding away, but the scope of what's really happening isn't yet fully realized, and Johnny at this point is just like an enigmatic dude carrying out some corporate cleanup duty. Your mission, burn it out. Purge it at absolutely any cost. This episode introduces all the basic weapons. You've got the pistols with a primary fire mode, which is about as effective as pissing on someone's shoes. But the ultimate fire charges up a really powerful blast, which can even lock onto multiple enemies. I pretty much only use this ultimate fire mode, and only then as a means to quickly wipe out a small cluster of those weaker enemies. After that, there's the shotgun, which is about as standard as shotguns come, but it also has an alternate fire mode that fires out an explosive energy projectile that stuns the tougher enemies. And of course, what would a shooter be without a super shotgun? And Turbo Overkill certainly doesn't fail to deliver. 
doing decent damage and also firing at these little sticky grenades that attach to enemies as its ultimate fire. Next, you've got dual SMGs, which can be swapped out for a single, slower but more damaging and accurate rifle. And then the chain gun, a belt-fed beast that's got a flame tower mode as well. And then rounding out the final weapon in the first episode is the rocket launcher, which is decent enough on its own, but then also has the benefit of being able to load in four rockets at once. Because sometimes you just want to fuck something up quadruple times. Then on constant cooldown, you've got a micro-missile launcher, which locks onto multiple enemies and even finishes off those tougher ones in a single hit. That's beautiful. That's nice. And the effect and the animation for this one just never gets old, and a perfectly timed blast can be a lifesaver. When this shit starts to get even deeper is when you start to get into all these augmentations, that very Bioshock inspired interface where you can modify how all of these different appendages work. I mean, I had it so my chainsaw is going to restore armor and health on kills. I had the missile launcher's cooldown reduced and then also its damage increased. And then on top of that, a decreased dash recharge for my legs. But there's so many other possible combinations and half of those have to either be bought or unlocked in the levels to begin with, which just gives the whole thing so much depth. Overall, it's a simple but effective roster, and you quickly get into that rhythm of swapping around between these guns as you need to, making use of all those different fire modes depending on what kind of situation you're thrown into. Fast weapon swapping is absolutely a strategy in this game, and although it's not entirely necessary, in this first episode it can be really useful in dealing fast and high damage to some of those tougher enemies, because you're still lacking some of those more harder hitting guns that you find in the second and the third episode. Still though, this first episode is really fun to play through, and the references and homages throughout this are just great fun. Like an entire level that's set in like a ghetto apartment high-rise that's taken right out of that 2012 Dread film, even down to it having the same half-pipe on the side of the building. Citizens of peach trees. Fuck. Fuck. This is the law. One of the last levels that you take to the skies in your flying car, doing strafing runs on enemies at the top of nearby buildings before hopping out and continuing the fight on foot. Platforming and the war running sections offer up a nice alternative as well, and the way they often flow right back into the combat means they never become boring or tedious. I feel like a lot of games have a tendency to spend too much time on the platforming outside of combat. I mean, I swear every single Sony exclusive has it in their design documents that they need to waste like 15 minutes of the player's time doing this crap. But Turbo Overkill does it in a way where it's enough to catch your breath as opposed to bringing your heart rate down to the point that you're gonna slip into a coma. It also helps that the game looks as amazing as it does and every time I start to get sick of these cyberpunk themes popping up in video games, I play through something like this that just reminds me how good that aesthetic can truly look. Plus, I really love that whole weird theme they've got going on here with all these organic computer systems meshed into the buildings with these screaming faces and distorted imagery. I mean, it's peak body horror. It really makes you feel like a pathetic creature of meat and bone. I mean, it's a scientific fact that highly detailed environments combined with really chunky polygonal enemies and pixelated textures is the absolute best vibe of all. And that's something that Turbo Overkill just absolutely nails. So as an introductory episode, the whole thing's kind of hard to fault. The only level I really struggle with that much is the final one, and that's not because it's badly designed or anything like that, but because most of it takes place on a train which is hurtling through the city at breakneck speeds. And whilst the foreground is perfectly still, everything around you is constantly moving, and for some reason that just gave me like the worst headache after a couple of minutes. Ah. Uh. Making me dizzy. The only solution then isn't even a solution. I just had to shut up and suck it up and stop being a little bitch. And it's a damn shame because I normally love these train levels in FPS games, but this one almost crippled me. But I mean, look, if the only thing I can really complain about is a totally subjective issue brought on by bad genetics and a bitch ass mentality, well, then we're off to a good start. And if this episode was all we got, well, then I still reckon you'd be getting your money's worth. But this is really only just the beginning. Oh my god, they won. Sin's controlled paradise. 
And I say that because episode two and three just take things to an entirely different level. The way the campaign from this point just keeps slowly ramping up and up is masterfully handled with some incredibly fun levels. All aboard the pain train, sir. I'm almost kind of jealous of people who get to play through this for the first time because it's truly one of those games where I wish I could just wipe my memory with like a neuralizer and go back in fresh all over again. After the end of the first episode, Sin has more or less completely taken over the city, and whilst the battle is most certainly lost, the war is far from over. So now you're left with little option but to completely evacuate the city to a starport and try to destroy Sin at the source. There it is, the starport and our last ticket off paradise. You get a nice little starting advantage too with the all new plasma gun, which has even got an alternate fire mode that's kind of like the microwave beam from Doom Eternal, heating up enemies over time like a casserole and then causing them to explode. Yeah, and get used to those Doom Eternal connections as well because that ain't even the half of it. I mean, you've got new enemies as well that have got energy shields who can only be taken out with the shotgun's alternate fire mode. Energy shields? Yeah, sounds familiar. The powered up fists you get in certain areas is more or less like the berserker power up from Doom, letting you rip and tear with your bare hands and smash most enemies to pieces with a single hit. And then, even later on in the third episode, when you're exploring certain cities where Sin's influence has completely taken over, all of this stuff is very reminiscent of those urban areas in Doom Eternal, where the hellish architecture had infested those nearby buildings. Now, seeing as Johnny's sort of gone rogue from Terror Tech at this point, the new antagonists come in the form of three bounty hunters who have to track him down, named Moore, Ripper, and Jazz. The last one who, for some reason, has an Australian accent. Johnny! Where's Johnny? And look, I might be the most bit up, grumpy old asshole on YouTube, but I will always smile when I hear someone in a video game putting on that most stereotypical Aussie accent. This is Democracy Manifest. <laughs> Jazz is also actually the first one you have to fight, and this whole encounter almost feels like a 1v1 deathmatch. With the benefit that once you beat him, you unlock a new skill called Turbo Time. It's Turbo Time. <laughs> okay, man. Okay, chill. Which is kind of like Bullet Time on LSD. And this becomes an almost essential skill because not only does it look super awesome and increase your gamer cred every time you activate it, but it's also got the benefit of increasing the damage you do and causing enemies to drop health. I almost kind of forgot I had this thing at first, only because I was so used to not having it in that first episode. But you're going to want to get accommodated with this mechanic really quickly because it is an absolute lifesaver in certain fights, and often the only way to get your health back. Plus, it's a mechanic that proves that murdering things violently in slow motion really never does get old. It was perfect. Aside from that, episode 2 also offers up a few new tricks and toys as well. Firstly, in the form of some more weapon upgrades, some of which are genuinely useful. Like there's an upgrade for the rocket launcher where it drops cluster bombs after being remotely detonated. And then the chain gun can be upgraded to remove the delay on the wind up time before it can actually start firing. There's a brand new sniper rifle which lets you teleport into the basic enemies and telefrag them on impact. And I don't know the logistics of how such a weapon could even work, but I'm hardly the one to look a bloodied gift horse in the mouth. And look, anything that glorifies and promotes telefragging is alright in my books. And then in a means to make sure the platforming doesn't just evolve into more wall running and double jumping, you've got a grappling hook. Because we all know that it's an unwritten rule that every first person shooter these days has to have one of these things. It can even be used to grapple into enemies, and then a further upgrade makes it so that grapple even sets enemies on fire. After putting Jazz out of his misery, you make your way through a factory and then reach the outskirts of the city, where we get what's easily the best level in the entire episode with Exodus. Can't let you take the man's wheels, son. Now this is where you hop on a badass looking motorbike and then have to avoid Sin's gigantic Mount Mordor looking laser eyes as you either run over or gun down whatever's in your way through these empty canals. This whole level kind of felt like Turbo Overkill's answer to Half-Life 2's Highway 17 if it ever got spliced with Mad Max. 
and it's this really cool, vast environment with multiple opportunities for the player to stop and explore the surrounding areas. Plus, the spectacle of having to avoid this humongous laser beam as it scorches the earth is just really awesome. Plus, it's on a much grander scale than anything the game's thrown at you beforehand. It doesn't wear out its welcome either, finishing at just the right point so you don't feel like the appeal of driving this new vehicle has started to lose its luster. This tunnel should be safe from that damned eye. The last few levels for this episode though where it turns into utter fucking chaos in the best possible way with arenas being packed with dozens of enemies and the game also introducing what's easily the best weapon in the game, the Ion Blaster. Now with this thing you aim it in the general area of whatever you want to kill and then an unseen satellite off in the orbit just rains down fire and brimstone on whatever's unlucky enough to be beneath it. You can hold it down for continuous damage, but then the alternate attack drops down the kind of blast that looks powerful enough to wipe out an entire suburb, and honestly feels like it should be a match-ending killstreak in Call of Duty or something. But this is the kind of thing I'm talking about in the way that Turbo Overkill really ramps up the gameplay to the point that even simple ground-based weapons don't really cut it anymore, and you resort to having to use weapons from out of the planet's atmosphere. It's just one of those really cool ways where they're constantly trying to outdo themselves and add in all these neat little things. I mean, they ever managed to find a way to work your mum into the game. <laughs> the final two encounters in episode two are the boss fights against those surviving bounty hunters, Ripper and Maul. So, um, here's the thing. Ripper is the one who has the most connection with Johnny's backstory, being seen in that very Robocop-inspired flashback where she shot him to bits and left him for dead. And overall this showdown is decent enough, but it does introduce a design concept that I'm not really fond of and I find kind of annoying, which is where you can only damage the boss for a short amount of time before they bugger off and spawn in waves of standard enemies. Here are my very special friends. Special friends, meet Johnny. Now kill him. And then, and only then, once you've taken all of these out, does the boss come back again and you can actually keep attacking them. And I've never been a fan of this idea in any video game because it just kind of feels like you're fighting their underlings more than you're fighting the actual boss. The fight against Moore after this takes place in some kind of weird futuristic blood sport arena where you take that guy on in various simulations before finally finishing him off. Except, not really, because from this point on, Moore actually becomes the key antagonist for the rest of the campaign, to the point that I genuinely got sick of seeing this guy. It really does start to become a bit silly just how many times and how many forms he comes back in, only for him to just keep getting an ass whooping time and time again. I mean, it's like Team Rocket from Pokemon all over again, just with more bloodshed. And if the finale for Episode 1 was Star Wars A New Hope in Reverse, well, then the ending of Episode 2 is Empire Strikes Back, with the good guys being at their absolute lowest point. With Moore as the main big bad guy now, the third episode begins with Johnny and Sam becoming allied with Sin. And if this whole sequence where there isn't like a direct homage to Shodan from System Shock, then I don't know what's real anymore. There is no survival for your kind. Poor, poor Earthlings. You really get to see humanity on its last legs here, fighting back against this insurmountable threat with blatant references to the Terminator movies, which are awesome, but also kind of fitting, really showing mankind on the brink of extinction. Without a doubt though, the best new thing they introduced in this episode is the inclusion of a second chainsaw leg, which, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because what's the only thing better than having one chainsaw for a leg? Well, having two. Even more than that, chainsaw arms, which can be charged up with melee kills, and then unleashed on enemies when needed the most. And do I really need to extol the virtues of having fucking chainsaws for arms? Didn't think so. Plus it introduces other NPCs that are more or less on the same side as Johnny. And although you barely see these people for more than two minutes, it really goes a long way to make you feel like you're playing your own role in this much larger conflict. Anyone? Anyone read us? And then on top of that, you've just got the constant and really well-paced loop of the gameplay, which is at its absolute best here. I remember there was a term that people often used when talking about Doom Eternal, where they referred to getting into the groove as being in the fun zone, and that's a feeling that I had for almost this entire episode. Because again, once things kick off, it really never does stop. And you almost kind of go into this Nirvana-like state, just cruising through the whole thing in autopilot and stomping almost everything that comes after you. 
The main thing that stuck out to me during this episode as well was the soundtrack, which just goes so above and beyond what you'd expect for a game like this, that it almost kind of sounds like it's in the wrong medium entirely. Now, I don't mean that as an insult. What I'm trying to say is that the music you hear during some of these climactic levels just starts to sound absolutely biblical, and it plays a really big part in making these sequences seem much more larger than life. Just kind of feels like this final episode is really firing on all cylinders, and every little trick you've learned beforehand is finally coming to a head. One of the final levels reminds me of the Mars Core mission from Doom Eternal, where you're smack bang in the middle of this large scale battle in space, grappling to the next giant piece of debris and fighting back against straggler enemies along the way. And the size and scope of this alone just absolutely shits over everything in Doom Eternal. Really is crazy man just how much they've crammed into this one section alone, and I feel like you could spend hours here just observing every little thing that's going on in the background. And again, it's a bit of a testament to how smooth and refined the controls are, in the way that despite being in more or less zero gravity and having these platforms and structures so far apart, that you can easily gauge what you need to do to get from area to area. You can jump, dash and grapple without even really having to think about it, like it's become second nature by that point. My favourite moment in this episode though, is when you get to pilot a mech suit and just go ham with those mini guns and missile launchers. And it just started to dawn on me when playing through this sequence that we really don't get enough mech sections in first person shooters anymore. Time wise you'd have one or two of these in every single game, but it's become a bit of a forgotten art form that's thankfully been brought back here in Turbo Overkill. My main critique with this episode is what I see as an over-reliance on Moore as the main antagonist, and he pops up frequently in certain areas as this tanky mini-boss type enemy that throws a spanner in the works and spouts off a bunch of intimidating dialogue. You have no purpose, Johnny. Really though, he just becomes a bit of a pain in the fucking ass. And when you finally get to that epic showdown, there's no mystery or tension around going toe to toe with him anymore, because you've literally already gone 10 rounds with the guy up until that point. Despite this not even really being the end of the campaign, this fight against Moore really does more or less serve as the final boss fight. And it comes back again to what I said about that fight against Ripper, where you're only allowed to damage him for a little bit before he spawns in the weaker enemies to do his wet work. You ever play the Ancient Ones DLC for Doom Eternal? Well, you had this really annoying boss fight at the end of it, where you'd attack the boss for a bit before he'd pop up a shield, shift the room around, and then send in a bunch of possessed demons to attack you. And that is kind of what this fight against Moore is like, only you have to go through this five times across the three or so forms that he keeps changing into. And I don't know man, like maybe I'm just impatient, but it seems really odd to kind of bog the player down like this, especially when there's nothing clever or even challenging about it. Having to take out the same few enemies you've already wiped out in droves up until that point just kind of makes the whole thing irritating and more like menial labor. And consider too that there's still a whole other level to go after this one. It's not even the final boss. <laughs> still though, minor problems aside, Turbo Overkill is one of the best shooters I've played in recent memory. And considering everything else that's come out recently as well, that's really saying something. It offers up a fun, challenging, and complex campaign with gorgeous visuals, a great soundtrack, and a cool premise. And in the long line of awesome indie games that somehow do it better than big budget AAA developers can, this is one to add to the top of that pile. The pedigree of Apogee Software, combined with the creativity and imagination of indie devs, has given us a shooter that's about as close to perfection as you could ever possibly get. And until someone else comes along and makes a game where you can mince up cyberpunk grunts with dual chainsaw legs, well, it's gonna be hard to beat. 